So, so with the multispectral image capture, we can create color pictures which have uh, more color accuracy. You may recall, you remember the leaf early on tried to do a four color bear, like, you know, with a teal, and then Sony puts a, a, a color on theirs. The reason they're adding that fourth color is to get better color accuracy. And it's true, it's unarguably good if you can add more colors, but when you're trying to do a single shot on a chip, you trade off spatial resolution, so the net result is we can't get there from here. However, since we're doing sequential image capture with a monochrome chip, adding another color is trivial. In fact, why add just one more? Why not add another one and another one? So our modeling suggests, and it's unarguably uh, demonstrable that you can get much higher color accuracy with five colors or six colors and reduce that to a color picture. So that puts the camera in the catbird seat now in terms of color accuracy. When we started modeling that color accuracy, realized how good that was, we said, well, how good are the prints? How good are the printers? So we sent out some test files to different printers, people who knew what they were doing, and said, I want you to print this LED file as accurately as you can and send me the print back and I will measure your print on our spectrophotometer and I'll grade you. And I was shockingly um, uh, disappointed at how poor the printers were. The very best print, the very, very best Delta E on my test was three and a half. So the camera is, our camera is now over two times better in terms of color accuracy than the best printer we could find, the best calibrated print we could find. And so I want to find a way to make the prints more accurate and more highly calibrated. I don't know what that is. I don't know how to do that. Megavision, uh, Eureka Vision system. The Megavision, Eureka Vision system, which includes a, a 40 megapixel or 50 megapixel monochrome camera and multispectral LED lights that have not only visible bands, uh, six visible bands, but they have five infrared bands and an ultraviolet band as well for doing discovery work and conservation work. So we can do color image capture as well as um, conservation and hyperspectral imaging at the same time. So we're just now starting to market the system, but as we've been, we developed the system, we started off because we had a need to read the Archimedean text in the in a palimpsest called the Archimedes Palimpsest, which was a medieval prayer book known to contain the, the writings of Archimedes under that had been scraped off so it was palimpsested. And we were looking for a technology to, to develop that. Bill Christensberry hit on the idea of rather than using a, a LCTF, a linear, a, a, a liquid crystal a, a variable filter or or narrow band um, filter uh, elements in a color wheel to use different colored lights to do the job. And that kind of was successful. Uh, so we took that and decided we should commercialize that. We, we didn't, we, we basically, when word of what, of the accomplishment leaked out, we got calls and the first call was from the Library of Congress who in, uh, night, in, in 2007 had, was um, in the process of acquiring the Valtimula map, which was America's birthright map. The Valtimula map is the first map is, uh, printed uh, by the map maker Valtimula in 1507, dedicated to Marigold Vespucci based on his writings of the New World. And um, Valtimula was the first map maker to make a map that showed the Americas as a separate continent and named it named this new continent, or continents, named it America. So from the time of its discovery in the Wolf Egg Castle in Germany, uh, until it was acquired by the United States, they kept trying to, to acquire it, and finally acquired it. And so on Capitol Hill, in the Jefferson Building, they created a, a new um, large display in the Library of Congress so the public can appreciate the map. Before the map went into its display case, which is hermetically sealed and bulletproof glass and hurricane-proof everything and plumbed and censored, it won't come out of that case for a generation. So before it went in, they needed a way to image it and get a spectral fingerprint of it. 
So we were called to do that. That was the first job we we did with the, the complete system. Subsequently, the Library of Congress has done has a program now where they are imaging all of the United States top treasures. Um, here is one of the first top treasures we did. You might recognize you might recognize the text. Um, four score and seven years ago, every child knows it. This is the the Nicolay draft of the. Uh, of the Gettysburg Address, which the public doesn't see, it's kept in the dark. Um, it's, in all likelihood, the the very uh, draft that Lincoln used when he delivered the Gettysburg Address. The ones, that, the drafts the public sees are were written after the fact. But this, you can see the fold lines across where it was folded to go into the vest pocket. Uh, you can see he ran out of ink on the first page, started writing in pencil on the second page. Fool's cap paper. Um, and so this was the first of the top treasures of the United States. Subsequently, the Declaration, the Virginia Charter, the uh, uh, Lyon Falls Plan, the map of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, a number of the, the treasures have been made. And an ongoing program exists to do all of the top treasures of the United States with this technology for a number of reasons. So from that, uh, a couple of other universities uh, heard about that, and so uh, even though the system was not developed, just the pieces were developed, they still wanted to begin working and do the do things with it. So Oxford University and um, uh, University of Mississippi, University of Kentucky, uh, I can't remember this, there's another one out there somewhere, I forgot who. Anyway, um, Getty is very keen oh, to have yeah. one. Yeah, there, there are a number of, of, uh, of systems now in the work as we're getting closer and closer to commercialization. So this photokina is kind of marks our announcement that we have a system that is ready to start being used by the general user. So we, we do two different things really with the system. It, the, because of the multispectral in the visible range, we're able to make very, very accurate color reproductions. Because of the multispectral in the visible and beyond visible range, we're able to discover, discover things that can't be seen with the naked eye. And that's the magic that gives us the ability to read under text of, uh, of documents uh, that have been scraped off. And we just looked at some um, uh, an ancient medieval manuscript called um, Chez de Moor, which is an early French manuscript held in the uh, uh, Dresden Library, uh, which was damaged during the bombings of Dresden in World War II. Sat under water. The, the bombs were powerful enough that it knocked over bookshelves. The books were already squirreled down in the basement for protection, but the bombs knocked over the bookshelf and then broke a water main. So they flooded and said in the water. So we were kind of recovering some of the text from, from that document recently. Um, I should show you a sample on the monitor, of, sure. of just so you get a visual. Of, I'm going to zoom this up. So these are uh, uh, Dead Sea Scroll fragments, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're working with the Israel, Israel Antiquities Authority to uh, develop a system specifically to do all of the, uh, the collection of Dead Sea Scrolls in Jerusalem. And this is a, a, a highly accurate color uh, image of what you see with your human eye. And you might notice in the black, you might notice there's some little something that looks like something in here. Well, if I take this, this image and I mix the luminance with the luminance channel, if I mix in the, uh, the infrared channel, you begin to now see and appreciate the fact that there's actually full text written under there. And this is where looking in bands beyond human vision becomes highly uh, highly productive. So we're able to read the, uh, the text. It, it can't be read with the naked eye by just looking at, uh, at, the, uh, color, at, at the object itself. So the data set that we collect... The data set that we gather, uh, we call it an image cube, visible and beyond, uh, become the primary the, the primary source of reference for the scholar who actually wants to look at the original document and read the text because it's more informative than the original itself. Um, it serves it serves 
two two sets of interests. It serves the scholar, of course, because they can see what they really want to see and need to see. It serves the conservator because the conservator no longer has to produce the original treasure and risk it being handled and risk it being exposed to um, photons which destroy these treasures. The Dead Sea Scrolls, in fact, when they go out on display, are only allowed a certain exposure. Uh, they only put them under like 25 bucks, and even then, they're only allowed to be out for a, a couple weeks at a time. And then they go back into darkness because all the exposure uh, gives them uh, less lighting time.